Hello and welcome to the next talk in the 2021 sets of the Open UK Future Leaders training sessions. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be made available soon afterwards on our YouTube channel. First, a little about the Open UK Future Leaders Group. The Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding and innovation, as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. It operates under the direction of the Open UK Legal and Policy Committee and has a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. The Future Leaders Group is currently co-chaired by me, Rob Reynolds from Phil Fisher, and Katie Gibson from Bristow's, and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and to new members, whether getting involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects. So please do get in contact if you'd like to get involved. And for today's session, we're pleased to be joined by Anand Prasad. Anand is an engineer and former startup founder who has been making command line tools for 12 years, the most well-known one being Docker Compose. He's originally from London and is currently building front-end architecture at Squarespace in New York. Anand will be taking us through what he considers the most important parts of both the philosophy and practical elements of the command line interface guidelines to hopefully dispel any fears that it has to be a confusing, inconsistent and even hostile experience at times. As usual, we'll have a chance for any questions at the end, so please do pop them in the chat box and we'll invite you onto voice and video to ask them yourself if you'd like to. Anand, welcome to our session today and thanks for joining us and over to you to talk about command line interface design, philosophy and practice. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone. My name is Anand, um, and this is a talk on command line interface design. And I feel like just saying that, I immediately have to justify it. Why on earth would I talk about command line interface design? This is not something that most people talk about, even within software. Why should you care? OK, well, almost all engineers or anyone who really works with software is going to end up using command line tools at some point. Engineers use them all day, every day. Other people who work sort of peripherally in software use command line tools now and again, maybe even every day. Uh, I think this is, un this is an uncontroversial statement, I think. What's less obvious, I think, is that almost all engineers will end up making command line tools as well. You might not make um, you might not make them as your job and you might not uh, make uh, especially widely used ones, but you almost certainly will end up making them too. Even if it's just like one-off build scripts, something that's specific to some project and never outlives it. Those things are still command line tools and they still um, are subject to the same rules for design and behavior as um, more widely used ones, more widely installed ones. I found myself making command line tools, especially open source ones, some time ago, usually to scratch some particular itch. These are the names of some of them. I would be very surprised if you had heard of any of them. Um, most of them were very obscure and have faded into nothing. I would just make something to solve some problem of my own, release it into the world. Sometimes other people found it useful too, sometimes not. Most of the time, no one even paid any attention. I did make one tool, however, that did gain some traction. It was called Fig, and uh, my friend Ben and I developed it together. And now it's called Docker Compose, and it may or may not be installed on your laptop. But regardless of how popular or not any tool I made was, what I would find over and over again was that I was asking this question, what are the best practices? Not really receiving an answer um, from the internet, from other people, and having to sort of, again and again, every time I made a new tool, I would have to sort of design from the gut. I just have to sort of intuit what, uh, what was the right thing to do. There are, of course, some best practices out there. There is, you know, some GNU guidelines on when to use standard out versus standard error and maybe some stuff about arguments and flags. And there are some, there are some great resources already. There are some blog posts and some talks, you know, like this talk where someone has clearly done a lot of thinking, 
put a lot of consideration into it, realize that like best practices for the command line aren't really documented in any sort of official way and decided to put something out into the world like a blog post to say like, here are some good practices and those are fantastic resources and uh, we benefited a lot from them when we were building what I'm about to talk about. But they, they do have a sort of ephemeral quality to them. They do sort of get lost in the churn and sort of decay over time. Um, they're not living documents. And of course, you know, the result of this sort of Wild West free for all feeling around how to design command line tools is that the command line itself is kind of a hostile and confusing experience. When you install a new tool, it's rare that you can sort of intuitively figure out how to use it, what it does even, um, what it's doing right now, what this error message means and so on. So, okay, so recently Ben, the other author of Docker Compose, found himself sitting down to write yet another command line tool and finally got fed up with this state of affairs and decided that the world would benefit from some sort of, not official obviously, it's impossible to have an official set of guidelines, but some, some set of guidelines that could be a sort of de facto standard for how command line tools should be designed and built. And so he got me and some other people together and we created the command line interface guidelines. And that's online now, it's at click.dev. I strongly recommend that you go check it out. Um, it was done by me, by Ben, by uh, another developer, Carl Tashian, and uh, technical writer, Eva Parrish. And we got our friend Mark to help with the design. Mark did not design these slides. So if you don't like how these slides look, don't blame him, blame me. Uh, and on that note, I want to stress that while command line interface guidelines, the document speaks with a single sort of authorial voice, I am not speaking in that voice today. This is an Anand Prasad talk, not a Clegg talk. Um, much of what I say is, is in the guidelines, but I am, I'm, I'm just talking for myself here. I didn't, I didn't run this talk by anyone else. I'm, I'm sort of giving you my own reckons. So what I'm going to do is talk about the philosophy that the command line interface guidelines espouses and use sort of practical advice to illustrate those philosophical points. Uh, it's a set of principles essentially that we open the guidelines with that we think define the sort of the, the, the right attitudes that lead to good command line software. And the first one I'm going to talk about is called human first design. This is the first one for a reason. If you were going to boil the entire guidelines down to one phrase, it would be this. It would be the idea that you design for humans first. And I think that this is perhaps the most controversial philosophical point that we're making, because I think that command line tools are treated as though they are mostly made for machines, like they are parts of, in a system, they're, they're cogs in a machine, and they don't have to be user-friendly or understandable, they just have to fit together nicely. And I frankly think that that's wrong-headed. Maybe it made sense once upon a time in the early days of the Unix environment, but today I think we should design for humans first and machines second. By way of example, I want to talk about the cat utility. Now, if you've ever used cat, you might remember this experience, but if you ever just typed cat at the terminal and hit enter, do you know what happens next? Nothing happens. It just hangs forever until you exit it, pressing control C or control D. When this happens to you, you might try to pass the help flag to it because that's a common thing to do if you are trying to figure out how to use a command line tool. And if you do that, cat complains at you and says that's an illegal option. And then it tells you some flags that you can pass to it, not telling you what any of them mean, just saying you can give it B, E, N, S, T, U, or V. And that's it. You're on your own. Now, what if you were trying to figure out what cat did in the first place? You'd be kind of lost, right? 
in fairness, you know, this this is a very, very old program. And like I say, attitudes and conventions were different back then. But that's kind of my point. We have moved on. And today we care about making command line tools for humans. This is a very easy problem to fix. Every single programming language has a way to check whether the current program is being run interactively or not. It's called and it's called something like is TTY. Uh, and if that variable is true, you can detect it and you can say, hey, uh, I'm being run interactively, but um, I shouldn't be. I should be given some input on standard in because that's the problem. Cat expects input on standard in. So you can say, hey, enter input on standard in, run with help for more options and exit the program immediately. Otherwise, you can assume that you're being run non-interactively, that, that the program is having input piped into it and you can and you can go ahead. This is a huge usability win for people who don't understand that they're supposed to pipe input into your program. Here's another example. I type rmfile.txt to remove a file. Did it work? I have no idea. I have to run another command to see if it worked. I have to ls and see if the file is still there. Or I have to just trust that because the command didn't say anything that it succeeded. We don't do this in other domains. In a graphical user interface, if you see no visual feedback when you perform an action, that usually means it hasn't happened yet or that the interface is broken. It used to be the rule, to be fair to RM, like it used to be the rule that when commands succeed, they should print nothing. But again, we have moved on. That rule might have made sense when everything was being used in shell scripts, and most of the time you didn't want every little command to print output, but shell scripts are much less of a going concern these days. These days, I feel like most commands invoked are invoked by humans. And even if they're not, I feel like this, that we do have the defaults the wrong way around. It's better to say something than nothing. Okay, next principle. Now that we've established that humans are the first priority, let's flip that round and argue for the opposite. Let's look at things from the machine's perspective. One of the terminal's great strengths is that you can combine small programs to make bigger programs. That is like the that is like the the primary sort of advantage it has over GUIs. With pipes and with shell scripts and other sort of constructs, you can put things together that the authors of those individual programs never imagined you might need to do. You can't do that in the GUI world. I mean, people have attempted things like it, but there simply isn't the same flexibility that you have in the command line. And this flexibility is only possible, excuse me, is only possible as long as those individual commands are designed to be simple parts that work together. I want to give an example of the power that this affords us. Here is a program, a six line, shell command. Six commands piped together. Some of you might recognize this, I don't know, or you might be able to figure it out what it does just by looking at it, but I'm going to show you. What this does is, given some input, it counts the frequencies of every word in the input and it gives you back the top 10 most common words along with a count for each. So you can see here, like, the most common word is the with 399 occurrences. The second most common word is two with 355 occurrences and so on. Okay, so how does this program do that? I'm gonna step through it. First, we're starting with a file of some kind. I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna use the markdown source of the command line interface guidelines themselves as the example here. So just catting that file will get you the text of the file. Next, what we're doing is a translate. That means uh, what we're doing is we're converting everything that's not a letter to a new line, and we're compressing multiple concurrent new lines into one. That means we essentially end up with one line per word. So where we, before we had command line interface guidelines all on one word, now we have command line interface guidelines, four lines, and so on, with all of the special characters stripped out. Next, we're doing another translate. This time, we're converting uppercase to lowercase. Next, we're doing a sort. That means we're sorting the lines in the file, and um, that means that the file begins with just a bunch of A's, because that's alphabetically the, 
the first word. So we've just got A-A-A-A-A, one line for every time the word A appears in the file. And of course it continues beyond that and eventually you'll see other words too, but I don't have room for that on the slide. The next thing we're doing is using the unique command to compress all of those subsequent occurrences of one word into one line. And with the dash C flag, it also gives us a count of how many it found. So we've got 315 occurrences of the word A. For some reason, we've got the word A, 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 E somewhere in the file, don't know why. We've got my name um, a couple of times, blah, blah, blah. We've got 21 occurrences of the word about, two occurrences of the word absolutely, and so on. So this is uh, a count, a frequency count of every word in the file. Next, we're sorting it, and this time we're sorting it in reverse numerical fashion. That means we are looking at the count and using that as our sorting key, and we're reversing it so that we get the most, the highest number first. And finally, we're just chopping off everything except the first 10 lines, and that gives us our result, the top 10 most common words in the file. Now, Unix doesn't have a built-in command called something like top 10 words but you string six smaller commands together and suddenly it does. That's incredible, I think. None of the creators of these commands ever anticipated necessarily that someone would one day need to count the top 10 most common words in a file. But all of a sudden, like, just with the very small, simple tools that they provided, you can do this. And of course, you can do an infinite number of other things too. For context, um, that program is not written by me. Um, it was written by Doug McElroy, the inventor of Unix pipelines, and it was done so in response to a program written by Donald Knuth, the sort of renowned computer scientist, creator of tech, which of course LaTeX is based on. Um, Donald Knuth's program to do it uh, was all written from scratch and it was 10 pages of literate Pascal. It was supposedly beautiful and brilliant and clever and extremely performant um, and Doug McElroy's command was a sort of response to it because um, what took a brilliant programmer 10 pages of code to do, Doug McElroy achieved in six lines of shell. This is a great story and you should go read more about it. You can search more shell, less egg to learn more about it. Um, in particular, there are some absolutely delicious quotes from Douglas McElroy about how brilliant and beautiful and utterly useless Donald Knuth's program was and how much better the Unix approach is. Just pretty fun reading. Okay, so that's just an illustration of this power, this simple parts that work together power, what it can afford you. Now you might think, and I've sort of intimated that these first two principles are in conflict with one another. And to some degree they are. That is the fundamental challenge of CLI design, is to achieve both. Fortunately, though, the designers of Unix anticipated this problem, and they gave us some tools to help mitigate it. One of them I'm going to talk about is the difference between standard out and standard error. When I pipe one command into another, say foo into bar, foo's standard out will get piped into bar's standard in. So foo's output becomes bar's input whose standard error output, on the other hand, will continue to go to the terminal. That means output for machines can go to standard out, information for humans can go to standard error, and the needs of the machine and the human are both served. Now this might seem obvious, but many programs don't actually respect this rule. I've seen many programs that, for example, print log messages to standard out, which means that their standard out can't really be parsed reliably and that makes them hard to reuse, hard to compose with other programs. And that breaks this principle of simple parts that work together and it prevents them from being reused and recomposed into bigger and more complex things. There's another question, speaking of output, of how to format your output. Now, like I say, human-first design dictates that by default, a command should produce readable output. Let's suppose we have a tasks command that's like a to-do list of some kind. By default, that task command should print readable output. That means like visual separation, it means lines, it means colors, where appropriate, you know, colors to demarcate important things that should catch the user's eye. And it means readable things like yesterday, today, tomorrow, instead of say machine readable date strings. 
but when when we pipe this out with this program into another program, it should detect that and it should produce machine readable output. That means one thing per line, no extraneous lines, tab separated values on each line, machine readable values like ISO date strings and no colors of any kind because that will mess up the parsing. Now you might also want to ha be able to produce JSON, which is great when uh, a program consuming this output needs more structure but that should be an opt-in thing. The Unix standard, the Unix default, the convention is line by line input. And so that should be the default. Now, you might think that this is unnecessary because you know, in, in your case, you don't foresee your program being used in pipes or shell scripts, but I can all but guarantee you that it will. People will, I can say this from experience, people will use your software in ways you didn't anticipate. Your program will become a part in a larger system, whether you intend it to or not. Your only choice, your only real choice is whether or not it will be a well-behaved part, whether or not it will be easy to reuse and compose. Okay, next principle is ease of discovery. For some context, the main drawback of the terminal is the difficulty of discovery, the low discoverability of the interface. With a GUI, when you look at a graphical user interface, you can intuit a lot of what is possible just by looking at it. You can see buttons and sliders and controls and text boxes, and you can sort of see the, the ways that you can interact are clear. The things that you can achieve are to some degree hinted at. This is not true of the terminal. The terminal is a blank screen and you really have no idea what is possible just by looking at it. Of course, this is also a strength. You know, what, what holds back GUIs is that, is that very rule. The fact that, you, that what's possible is constrained by what you can put on the screen. In the terminal, you have no such constraint. You have complete freedom. You can do all kinds of things that are not clear by looking at it. But of course, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. When it comes to figuring out what you can do and how to do it, the terminal is at a huge disadvantage here. And that means that we have to work to make CLI programs more discoverable because we don't get it by default. A good example of making a command discoverable is git status. When I run git status, I don't just see the current status. I don't just see what files are staged or not staged or not tracked or that kind of thing. I also see some things I can do to change that state. It says that I can git add to update, I can git restore to discard changes, I can git commit in order to commit stuff. It's, um, it's telling me a sort of, uh, it's like, it's, it's almost analogous to having a sort of a bunch of buttons laid out in front of me to click. It's I'm being told some like possible next steps I can take. It's almost a miniature Git tutorial that I'm getting right here. Just right, baked right into one of Git's most common commands is just like a miniature tutorial of like what I can do. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if this were one of the primary ways that people learn Git, just by looking at what commands it suggests. This dovetails quite nicely into the next principle, which is conversation as the norm. So another advantage that graphical interfaces have over the terminal is the way that they employ metaphor. The desktop we talk about is a metaphor for an actual desktop covered in actual files. It's easy to forget this, but it was supposed to be that back in the day. You were supposed to think about moving pieces of paper around on a desk, and some of them were stored in you know, folders, physical folders. Of course, buttons and sliders and switches and that kind of thing are all metaphors for their real world counterparts, which sort of makes a bit more intuitive sense. Metaphor is not readily available to us in the terminal. We don't have a whole lot of it. But there is a sort of metaphor that's been hiding in plain sight this whole time, which is, I think, conversation. Beyond very, very simple commands, running a program usually involves typing it over and over again. You type something, but you get it wrong, and then the program complains at you, and then you change something, and you do it again, and it like, gives you something, and then you go like, okay, I'll, you do something different. And it's sort of a back and forth. It's a back and forth and it's a sort of, uh, even when it's not just a trial and error thing, even when you're just finding something out and running a sequence of commands, it is a little like you're having a conversation with the machine. 
If we acknowledge that metaphor, we can start to make the interaction better by making the conversation more pleasant. So that get status command is an interesting example of that because it's saying like, here you go, and uh, here's something you might want to do next. And you're like, oh, maybe I will. Again, Git uh, has great examples. Um, when you when you check out, um, it you don't just it doesn't just switch you to a branch. It also tells you like what the current status of this branch is and how you can update it. So I check out master, and it's like, hey, you're behind. You might want to get pull to update. It's just a very small example, but it's little things like this that really make the interaction just sort of flow more smoothly. Okay, consistency across programs. Another way that we can alleviate this inherent difficulty of the terminal, this lack of discoverability, is through consistency. Because the more consistent programs are with each other, the more predictable they are, the more a user can just sort of guess at things to do without having to look up documentation, and so the faster they'll move. So the more consistent things are, in general, the more predictable they are. Flags are the easiest example of this. Um, most commands denote flags with two hyphens and a word, and then they might have a short version of that command with a single hyphen and a single letter. And that is a very normal, a very standard way to design CLI programs. But not every program does this. Some programs break those rules. They'll have like a single hyphen in a word, for example. Those programs are my enemies. Please don't do this. Please follow conventions. When you ignore conventions like this, you waste people's time. There's really no advantage to it. Speaking of flags and standards and conventions and stuff, there are lots of commonly used flag names. And you should try and use these when appropriate. So like, for example, all means operate on all things. Debug means print more information. Very, very importantly, H and help mean print the help text. These ones you must absolutely support because dash H or dash dash help will likely be the first thing a user passes to your program so that they can learn about it. So it's incredibly important. Try to use these standard flags when you can. Try not to use them to mean anything else, and try not to use those single letters to mean anything else either. Speaking of standards, there are also uh, some de facto standards for environment variables that are good things to use where, um, where appropriate. So if you need to look up something in the user's home path, you should use the home environment variable. If you need to create a temporary file, you should use the temp directory variable. Very important, uh, if the user passes no color, they set that variable, you should disable colored output because that means they are be, they're being very explicit about not wanting colored output, and so on. Now, sometimes consistency can conflict with ease of use. When I was talking about human-first design, I cited CAT and RM as examples of, um, of you know, not being very easy to use for humans. But in both cases, they were being consistent with the rules of the operating system at the time they were made. So they had, you know, you have this choice sometimes of, do I, should I be consistent or should I be easy to use? Now, usually this is a false dichotomy and usually you can be both, but sometimes you honestly just can't. And in those cases where they conflict, it's my feeling that ease of use should almost always win. And if for whatever reason you need to be consistent instead of easy to use, then you should go out of your way to mitigate that as much as possible by explaining to the user, by making sure it's clear to them that like things work this way for a reason and you know maybe apologize for it. Okay, saying just enough. We've already talked about how a program can say too little. And again, in the case of CAT and RM, these programs, in my opinion, do not say enough. Can a program say too much? Let's have a look at this program. I want to make it clear that I'm not dissing this program specifically. I'm just talking about a general pattern that I see. This program, I've asked it to install its dependencies, and I am getting an awful lot of output. Is there useful information in here? There might be some, 
but if there is, I can, I can see some colored text fly by, but it's all being carried away on this stream of extraneous output that is mostly URLs, it seems. Uh, I don't think that these URLs are useful to me as a user of the program. I don't think that if I were to visit any of these URLs that I would learn anything useful. Instead, I'm just being bombarded with output. I don't really understand any of it. And if I needed to find out something from this output, I would have to go hunting for it. Again, I'm not calling out Maven here. Lots and lots of software does this. Really, if, if you're doing something like installing some dependencies, you really don't need to say very much at all. You pretty much need to say that you installed them and maybe how many, just as a little, as a little sanity check. Um, it can be a difficult balance to strike, I'll acknowledge that, but you do have to try. If you need to, or you think that the user might in some cases need to know more, you can always have a verbose flag, a debug flag, that will uh, print out more information. And if you have, and to be fair, installation of dependencies is a pretty complex operation. A lot of things can go wrong and you might need to produce a lot of output for debugging purposes, in which case you can always log to a file and just tell the user where the log is so that they can choose to go and look at it if they want to. All right, robustness. Robustness really means, is, is, it's really two different things. There's um, objective robustness and subjective robustness. Objective robustness is stuff that I think as software engineers, we all generally agree on. We all generally agree that programs should handle unexpected input, that they should recover from crashes automatically. They should minimally, they should block on remote services as little as possible, that kind of thing. This, this stuff is the, is the nuts and bolts of making software. And all of this stuff is uncontroversial. This is true anywhere um, anywhere in software, not just the command line. But there is also, and I think this is also generalizable beyond the command line, an idea of subjective robustness, which is about creating a feeling of solidity. It's difficult to quantify, and it's difficult to talk about, it's difficult to sort of pin down how to achieve it. It's the, feeling, it's the feeling you get when you push a well-engineered, heavy-duty mechanical button and you feel a clunk and you hear something or you see something happen with some machine to show that things, and you, you can see that something happened as the result of what you did. And it's that feeling compared to the feeling of, I don't know, using a touch screen on a ticket machine and like, tapping the screen and nothing happening and like having to like really like jab it with your thumb and then it responds a few seconds later and then it sort of, you know, glitches. That's the, the software running it might, might be doing its thing and it might be working totally fine, but it doesn't feel like it is. And you're sort of left wondering, you're, sort of, you're left with no confidence in the software at all and no confidence in the machine in general. It's the difference between those two feelings. Subjective robustness is about creating that satisfying mechanical feeling. Again, like I say, in terms of how to achieve it, it's very hard to quantify, but it is mostly a lot of small things. So let's revisit that install command from before, because arguably I think I made it a little worse when I redesigned it output. So let's look at how it actually feels to type. You type install, and what happens? Nothing until it's finished installing, and then you see that it installed three dependencies. But, I mean, the problem here is obvious. Let's run it again. The problem is that after hitting enter, nothing happens, and I'm left wondering if it's actually doing anything or not. I don't know if it's just taking a while. I don't know if my computer has crashed. I don't know if the command has, like, gone wrong and it's just uh, idling. I have no idea, or maybe it's waiting for input. I, I really have no idea. Um, let's see how we might do this better. So what if immediately after I hit enter, I see some output? And not only that, but it updates as it installs each dependency, and then it says done. 
I mean, this is obviously just immediately better because I am no longer wondering as soon as I hit enter, I see feedback. And I'm no longer wondering if the software is even working at all. This is very unfancy. You know, there could be a progress bar or a little, a little ASCII spinner or something like that. Um, those things are good. They're definitely good, but they're not even that necessary. What's really paramount is that you respond to user input as soon as possible. Another thing that goes a long way to creating this subjective robustness feeling is understandable error messages. If you print a stack trace when something goes wrong, the user is going to blame your software. That's just how it is. In this case, we've got a connection refused. That might not be the program's fault. It might be that the internet is down, but the program has not anticipated this error and it's printed a stack trace and the user is 100% going to blame the program for this unless they know what econ refused means, of course, which is going to be, I think we can assume a minority of users. If you instead explain the error messages in terms that they understand, then, well, two things happen. Firstly, the user solves their problem more quickly because they're like, oh, the internet's down, I'll go like reboot the router or something like that. But also, like, arguably even more importantly, they don't blame your software. You are no longer like on the hook for um, this error and uh, your software is, is not diminished in their eyes. They're like, oh, right, I've got to go fix the, I've got to fix the Wi-Fi. For a truly great example of an error message, look at this one from Elm. This is a type error that is pretty complicated and that I do not understand, for example. But the error message is so good, it shows you exactly where the problem is, it gives you a description of the problem, it gives you a sort of suggestion for how to fix it, uh, and it links off to a place where you can read more. And a nice bonus here is that if you produce an error message this good, then maybe you too will get a shout out from John Carmack, one of the most successful programmers of all time. So that's a little nice bonus for you. All right, last principle, empathy. Error messages are a good example of practicing empathy. Empathy is also like subjective robustness about creating a feeling. Specifically, it's the feeling that you are on the user's side and you want them to succeed. Great example of empathy is writing the readme first. I love to do this. I love to write the readme before I've even written the software. And this goes beyond the command line. It does several things, really. Firstly, it makes sure there's a readme, which is very important. A low bar to clear, but a good one to do, if you can, please. Um, secondly, it forces you to explain the tool in terms that someone else can understand, which means that you have to make sure, it sort of forces you to like hammer out your idea and make sure that it's simple enough to be explainable. And thirdly, it forces you to see it from someone else's perspective, which is a great way to sort of surface inconsistencies that you might not have noticed because you were too close to the implementation. This is a generalizable rule far beyond the command line, of course. Writing documentation is a great way to practice empathy and it is a great way to make the software better. Maybe the number one way to make better software is to write the documentation first or to write the documentation as you are writing the code. This applies to the help text too, because a lot of people will skip the readme and go straight to the help text. So um, this is a very good example of a sort of minimal help text, just usage, global options, subcommands. Um, you can go above and beyond this, of course. The tool JQ has amazing help text. It gives you a single line description, command line JSON processor, tells you how you can use it, gives you a longer description, gives you a link to the documentation, and finally gives you a very simple example of how to use it. It also links off to, you can see a man page. If you don't know what a man page is, it is basically documentation in the terminal, which is a fantastic way to get documentation to the user because you don't have to context switch out of the terminal to see it. You just type man and then the command and you're right there. So this is great. Um, it's quicker to get to and also it stays in sync because there is a problem where like if you re release subsequent versions of your software and update your website with documentation, then people with old versions of the software get confused because they're reading documentation for the new version, but they've got the old version installed. Man pages are much more likely to stay in sync with what's installed on the user's machine. Now, some, some programs go one better in fact, and they, actually integrate that man page like interface into the command itself. So here you can type git help commit. Let me just show you that again. 
you type git help commit. So it's right there in the git command and you get essentially a man page that you can scroll through, which is fantastic because you can fit so much more in here. I'm not going to say that the git help pages are great, by the way, because they can be a bit confusing, but, but anyway. So these are our principles. Um, that was a lot to cover. I didn't get nearly uh, into like all of the practical advice we have. There's just so much of it, but these are what we consider to be the fundamental principles of good CLI design. And I want to finish by talking about one more principle, which I call chaos. Because of, after all this preaching about consistency and conventions, I want to acknowledge that chaos can be a force for good. The world of the terminal is chaotic. It is a mess. And Sometimes out of that mess come new and good ideas. Sometimes breaking the rules is necessary and sometimes it leads to new and better rules even. So a time might have to come when you have to break the rules. All I'll say is do it with intention and with clarity of purpose. Finally, don't be afraid. There's a lot to be said about CLI design and it might seem overwhelming, but that's just Good design. Good design is complicated. As software engineers, we sometimes think of design, especially user experience design, as being someone else's job. But in the world of the terminal, it is our job. My hope is that the command line interface guidelines make that job less scary and not more. Thanks very much and go check out Click. Thanks, Anand. That was a great presentation. Really interesting. And uh, yeah, some really interesting points you put in there. I think it's, yeah, the idea of design in the command line is definitely something that I think a lot of people forget. And uh, it's something that I wish had been thought about a bit more before I started dabbling and learning and breaking and, and yeah, pulling my hair out looking for documentation and things. So please, can you be in charge of more projects in, in trying to get their, <laughs> get their help files sorted and consistent things like that? I think the one comment I have before we, we go to questions, it's really interesting the, the, the similarities between sort of a lawyer drafting a document, getting their definitions in the right place, making them all kind of make sense. There's a lot of sort of similarity there. That's a lawyer designing the kind of terms I want to use throughout the document and getting those consistent and using the same style of that kind of mm. uh, calling it the same thing. It's a similar idea of uh, you see many contracts that have nightmarish definitions or not enough of yeah. them, or you can see someone's used a crowbar to get a definition in the right place that then just doesn't fit the syntax of the rest of the document. Uh, and so, yeah, it's really interesting thing. It's the same rules that apply on all things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just think about these things in advance. So. That's, that's, that's a very interesting analogy. In fact, I remember, I remember Ben who I, you know, who I, with whom I co-authored Docker Compose um, once said this about legalese. He was like, he was fascinated by because we were, you know, we were doing our startup and we were, we, there were, there was all kinds of legal documentation and stuff. And he, and he, and he, he kept saying like, it's, it's like code for the real world. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And if only if it was, uh, if only if it was so well organized. And so, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. It's got an awful lot of uh, historic detritus that's going yeah. on, before, unfortunately. So, uh, so yeah, thank you. Any, any questions from uh, those we've had in the, on the talk i know we've had a couple of comments saying thank you for a great presentation and i, I will echo oh. that definitely oh uh, jorge you've got a question do you, uh, do you have for me to read it out or would you like to come on and say it i'm going to take the silence probably as for me to go for it so uh, <laughs> i'm thinking in the future there's where machines write code how to intervene to avoid lost sense in what has been programmed and like how to not lose understanding interesting question that is a very interesting question. I mean, I am, um, I'm very, uh, I'm very skeptical of the idea that, um, that the majority of code will ever be uh, written by machines. Now that might just me be because I'm old school and it, or it might just be because I'm naive or it might just be because I'm in denial about my, uh, about losing my employability. But, um, but uh, more seriously, I think, um, I, I, th I think that where I can see that happening is, is in, um, in software such as um, some very machine learning heavy software, which I will admit is far, far away from my area of expertise, where um, I think we can already see that, um, that uh, a lack of the kind of visibility that we have with human authored code 
is already causing problems. It's like we don't, you know, we, we, we you know, a, a neural network becomes a sort of black box and that we do not have visibility into. I wish I had a good answer for how we mitigate that problem um, uh, because, because it scares me, honestly. Um, almost as much as as, as the prospect of, uh, of of losing my uh, employability does, but um, I, I I have I have seen from my from my friends who who, who do actually do machine learning stuff like I've seen uh, interesting stuff from them sometimes about how you visualize like how uh, how a machine sees the world. But honestly, yeah, I'm 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 as at sea as you are here. Thank you. It's, it's nice to know that the software engineers are just as scared of losing their jobs from machine learning as <laughs> every other every other industry that is being targeted by machine yeah, learning. Yeah, I mean, we'd like to think we're immune from that from from that uh, that 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 whole tidal wave, but no, I don't. Creating think your own yeah. downfall as well. Right? Yeah, no, it's very <laughs> ironic. Uh, always says thank you as well. Uh, any other questions, Amanda? Usually, you've got a couple of things you'd like to ask as well. Know if you can pop on. from my unmute button not particularly it's all new to me and i'm just absorbing and thinking it's a lot to take on board no worries i think we've had another one from jorge uh, saying uh why is human interface not so common why are people not thinking about it i think is what he's trying to say right very true well yeah i think that in in the world of the terminal um there has been a um I, I, th I think it's a I think it's a couple of things maybe I think that the people who designed the like originally designed the Unix programming environment were very concerned with human interface design and they were using themselves as their as 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 their testers which is a very common thing still to do in software um, and they were built they were designing an, a programming environment that made them personally as efficient as possible. And I think that they did an incredibly good job of that. But in doing so, they over-optimized for a case, uh, the case where you are sort of soaked in the, in the world, in the knowledge, in the culture of programming Unix machines. Um, and, the, you know, absorbed, that, that you, you are constantly absorbing the, um, the, the norms and the knowledge that uh, the terminal requires. And that unfortunately like hasn't scaled especially well as more and more people have adopted uh, a programming paradigm that revolves around the terminal and that more and more people have adopted um, operating systems that use it like, like Linux and Mac OS. Um, and it hasn't scaled especially well because that world was a very uh, was, was compared to today was very small, was very academic, and was very focused around like learning a lot and reading a lot of manuals before you ever got to like sit down in front of a computer, for example. Um, we we simply don't learn that way today, and we don't work that way today because software is huge business, and because new people to software are expected to be productive from like day day one, or maybe day two if you give them a little bit of leeway. So. Um, so it simply hasn't um, adapted very well to this world where, you know, arguably, and, and, argue, and arguably, you know, there, there is a lot to criticize about this way we work today. Um, but whatever you think of it, uh, I think it's undeniable that the, the way the terminal was originally designed uh, was not very amenable to the way that we use it today. Actually, I do have one quick question, Anand. Um, one of the things that I've been working on over the last few months for Open UK is our second kids camp, which will run from the end of July for a month. And what we do with that is we have 10 lessons. Each of them is animated. They're sort of 10 to 20 minutes long. We did um, 10 last year where we very much focused on digital skills and at the end of each lesson we said and here's a little bit about open source this time what we've done is we've based it on the open source definition so each of the 10 lessons is one of the definitions still got a lot of digital skills and we've tried to introduce more sort of business and real world concepts because we're concerned about the practicality of education mm. so you know we talk about things like linus's law that kind of stuff 
really making it a norm for kids as they're, they're learning to do something fun with a, a glove kit to be thinking about open source and we go from using uh, Microsoft make code which is uh, you know block language mm. which we used for all of last year to this year having four of the coding sessions in Python right. and one in Java the final one is in Java which is a you know whoo. but I'm wondering I mean it's... Java still scares me to this day so you know. <laughs> well this is for 11 to 15 year olds so you can only yeah. imagine <laughs> I'm wondering if there's something around all of this that we should be gently introducing. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about machine and human readable and the difference and mm. really driving home that understanding of what open source is and the requirement for both that and an OSI license. I wonder yeah. if there's something around this that we should, you know, just a sentence we should be introducing. I remember... Um... When I, when I received my education in how to use the terminal, it was, in, it, was, it was in an almost throwaway session at the very start of my university computer science course. It was, it was I'm pretty sure, a single session that just had some stuff on. It was, pretty, it was pretty much like giving you just enough that you could find your way around a uh, directory structure. You could CD and LS and that kind of thing, and you could create files and, and delete them and that kind of thing. And that was, that was just enough to you know, get us to the point where we could you know, use the actual programming language and compiler tools that we were using to, you know, to learn computer science. But um, even that even that small session was fascinating, I thought, and uh, sort of led me down this garden path of into, into learning about pipes and shell scripts and, uh, and, and loops and other, other constructs. And it was, um, it was an amazing way, uh, and, that, and that was sort of, you know, it, it's not something that is commonly encouraged to learn about. And I think that that's a great shame because, uh, as I hope I demonstrated with my example of that, like that, that six line, that six line command, you can put small things together and do amazing things with them. And it's almost like a, it's almost like a textual version of something like the, of what I presume that block language you describe is like, or something like, uh, or something like squeak or scratch, where, um, yeah, where you, like, you really are just sort of plugging yeah. things together exactly. to like, to do cool stuff, except you're doing it in a way that it's entirely text based, which of course, you know, is a lot less intuitive for a, for a human being, especially an eleven-year-old human being, to uh, to attempt, but is like, but like I say, like I like I hopefully make the point, like it has a great advantage that you're so much less limited by like the constraints of the GUI. So it seems like it would be almost a natural step after after doing some visual connecting of stuff together to sort of take that into the terminal and do something like strongly analogous to it in text. And that's exactly what we've done with Python. Right. So it was followed that process, and then with Python, we spent a lot of time explaining, you know, how easy it is to get something wrong. Yeah. And looking for editors and that kind of things, and for Brits, and there's thank, also thank goodness things. Python's error messages are as good as they are, because you know, I mean, not you know, the bar is obviously on the floor here, but like um, Python at least puts some effort into it. Yeah. No. Interesting. Thank you. All right. There's any other questions? I think we've not had any more. Uh, then I'll just say thank you very much, and it was a really great talk and really, uh, really fantastic to speak to you today and to have a chat about command line uh, interface design and things. Um, Amanda, do you want to talk about the uh, the report? Yeah. So um, let me put my video on. Probably at a strange height. Um, Open UK has been conducting, as many of you know, a survey over the last six weeks. We did it for about three and a half, four weeks. And like everything else we do, we move at quite a, a swift pace. So we will be sharing the output of that on the 7th of July. Uh, the report is actually final and it's off with the graphic designer already. Uh, we'll have a, a two-hour drinks uh, from five to seven on the seventh, which everybody's invited to. So let us know if you want to attend. And on the future leaders talk that week is it the ninth? What I thought I would do is just come in and talk about that report and do a sort of Q and A on it. Um, if I give you a sneak preview, because this video will not be out, um, or maybe it will be. 
we're very we're, we're very close to 100% adoption across UK businesses for open source, which I think is really interesting. I won't give you the exact number. I'll keep that because that's probably the headline, but very, very close. And I think it'll be quite an interesting discussion. So we'll see if we can get a few people who are, are perhaps part of the report to come along with me and just open that up and have a chat. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, my last plug as well. Uh, do remember to get your nominations in for the Open UK Awards. Uh, they take categories spanning hardware, software, data, finance, sustainability, individuals, young persons, and belonging. And nominations close on Sunday. So you've still got a little bit of time to get them in. Uh, just go to the website and there'll be more information there. And then, yeah, thank you very much for joining and see you all on the next talk. Cheers, everybody. Take care.